This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and it's yet another Samsung smartphone, but this one's a little bit different. It's the Samsung Galaxy Alpha. Alpha is supposed to be, you know, top dog, that kind of thing. And it's getting there. It's getting there. They have a metal ring around the sides now. No more faux chrome. Makes it look a little bit classier. Also, obviously, a direct competitor to the iPhone 6. 4.7 inch display. A little bit more quality look and feel. Only weighs only 4 ounces, too. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, the Samsung Galaxy Alpha. That's for you people who say that phablets are just not for me. They're way too huge. Even the 5.1 inch Samsung Galaxy S5 is kind of too big for my stylish pockets, for my small hand, whatever it is. You remember the good old days when 4.7 inch was kind of the standard phone or last year's Moto X. Everybody praised it because it was just the right size to sound like something out of Goldilocks. Well, this is it all over again. Notice the sides particularly. Okay, this is the big deal. And it's almost sad in a way, isn't it? Some people have been calling this the metal Samsung phone, the Galaxy Alpha. I wouldn't call it metal unless there's a whole lot more metal on it, but what they have done is put lovely aluminum sides on this. Finally, some metal on a Samsung phone, and it wraps all the way around. You can see there's little antenna lines, a lot more subtle than Apple's gone for with the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. It looks good. It feels great. It's the straight-sided design that we saw on the iPhone 5 and 5S, so Samsung's kind of like one generation behind for copying a look, but it's very practical because it's easy to grip. And the sides do have curves right here, so, you know, it's not going to gouge your hand too much or anything like that. It makes it a nicer looking phone, certainly. Uh, at first blush, because it's a Samsung phone, when you look at it, you might think, well, they found a much better faux metal to use, but it really is metal. So nice looking. Uh, the rest of the story is it's traditional Samsung phone. I think from the front view, nobody is going to mistake this for anything else. It has their distinctive oval-shaped home button. They're still using the mechanical home button. Capacitive buttons flanking on the sides right there. They light up when you touch them. And you can get it with your choice of a... This is the black model. So it's really a charcoal gray. It's not a black, black face. I almost would like a full black face a little bit better. It might look even a little more classy. And it has the very faint checkerboard pattern underneath. A little hard to see unless you've got good light and have it up close. Uh, it looks a little better than the white model only because there's two sensors over here and then the front camera and those become a bunch of black dots on the white model. Otherwise, the white model looks pretty good. Also available in that hideous gold. I'm sorry if you like it. Really, I am. But it looks like Rust-Oleum spray painted on shiny, icky, wow, tacky gold. But it's there in case you do like it. Not everybody has my taste. So the back on this, exactly like the Samsung Galaxy S5. It's got the faux leather plastic back here, which I never had any problems with, honestly. It's very grippy. It's not bad looking at all. Finer pattern of stippled dots on here because it is a smaller phone, but other than that, pretty much the same thing. It doesn't look bad at all. It's got a little bit of curve where it meets the metal on the sides, and it's the same color options, like I said, as with the Galaxy S5. There's that amazing shiny gold, and then there's the white, which is kind of pearlescent, slightly shiny, not as grippy kind of finish, but isn't bad looking at all. Camera protrudes a little bit. Ooh, ah, I know you people are having worries about that with the iPhone 6. Having a protruding camera is pretty much normal, especially for skinny phones. Very skinny phone here. Four ounces, too. Incredibly light, which is quite nice. Samsung's always good at making a phone light, and that was easy to do with plastic. So now they've introduced aluminum, which is a lightweight metal. It's still a pretty good accomplishment here to come in less than the iPhone four, uh, 6 in terms of weight, which is 4.55 ounces versus 4 ounces here. That little notch you're looking at right there, yes, you can still remove the back. Boy, Samsung does do an amazing thing there because this phone is so darn skinny and everything else. You can take the back off, and that's where the aesthetic disappointment, you know, ends because it's the usual plasticky, bendy, flimsy little back on there. And there it is, removable battery. Awesome to see right there. And we have our nano SIM card slot. So far, Samsung has been going with the micro SIM card slot that finally moved down to the even smaller one. Obviously, this being a teeny phone, that really helps matters. There's our 12 megapixel camera right there, the LED flash, and there's the heart rate sensor there below the flash. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So there it is, still removable back. Notice no micro SD card slot. Because they made it so darn small and so darn skinny, there's just no room for it. So no expandable storage. The good news is 32 gigs of internal storage. So you've got a decent amount to work with there. For those of you who like to carry around a huge library of movies, um, 400 albums, instead of using cloud streaming for those kind of services, then it's going to be a problem. You might want 
Galaxy or some other phone with a micro SD card slot. But for otherwise, it's plenty enough to install a bunch of big fat 3D games, and those are multi gigabytes these days. Several full HD movies. Not bad. Now, how much does this phone cost? It is the usual $199 with two year contract and $612.99 on AT&T. How they came up with that round number, I really don't know. That's around $25 a month if you're doing one of those AT&T next monthly installment plans. So it's the same price as the Galaxy S5. That kind of sort of hurts in some ways. Here's our Galaxy S5, and you get an idea of the size difference there. So for those of you who like the Galaxy S5 and say, I want something a little bit smaller, you get it. So you're getting the aluminum body here, the even lighter weight, this, the nice build quality. But other than that, you're not going up anywhere in terms of specs with the little guy. In fact, you're going down in a few ways. Now, I'm going to say that some people are just a little too specs conscious when they have a hissy fit about the fact that our 4.7 inch friend has a 720p Super AMOLED display. Super AMOLED displays at up to 4.7 inches can only go so high in terms of resolution. When Samsung switched to go to full HD displays, they went up to a 5 inch display for a reason because the pixel density can only go so far. Most 4.7 inch phones and smaller are 720p, 1280 by 720. The iPhone 6 working with a slightly different resolution and to ensure that 326 exactly PPI, so-called retina pixel density, is a little bit higher. It's like you know, 1334 by 750 versus 1280 by 720. You're not going to see that kind of difference so much. So if it's good enough for the iPhone 6, I'd say it's good enough in terms of resolution for this fellow right here. The the complaint that would be more valid is Super AMOLED displays have various technologies. This uses a pentile matrix. Now, there's many different pentile matrix displays, and this one is pretty similar to the Samsung Galaxy Note 3 last year's technology. Not quite as bright a white, as neutral in terms of colors as the Galaxy S5. So if you're doing a lot of reading, you might notice the whites are not as white in the background, that sort of thing. And if you look really closely, you might see some haloing around text. Now, I do like to read ebooks on the phone, and I can tell you that this has not really been a problem for me. And let's open up Google Playbooks right here so we can see that. Now, keep in mind one thing that Samsung does. By default, they have their adaptive color palette turned on. One thing it does is if you open up particularly Google Playbooks, is it kind of grays out the whites a little bit to make it a little bit more restful on your eyes. You can disable that and get a whiter white. But let's compare that to our Samsung Galaxy S5 so you can see the difference. So they're both set with, Google Play Books has its own brightness setting, both set with auto brightness. You can see the white's a bit whiter and not quite as overly cool, typical of Super AMOLED like this 4.7 inch Galaxy Alpha. But it's not terrible looking side by side exactly, is it? It's not. And if you want to go with manual settings, for example, I, I choose the the AMOLED photo mode, which is really the closest to being color accurate, then you won't get these different brightness and color effects when you're in different applications. And you'll actually get a little more neutral white for those of you who prefer a neutral white. Others of you may like this kind of reading background that gets a little less white. Anyway, that's what people are complaining about, really. And I think it's actually a pretty nice looking display. And I can tell you that, sadly, we can't show you some neat movie on Netflix or something like that. But I've been using this to watch movies on Netflix streaming HD, and they look really nice. Super AMOLED, the colors pop like crazy. You get those deep blacks and super high contrast on so it's not that bad a display. I suggest more than worrying about what other people say, go look at it in the store for yourself and see how you feel about the display if you think that you like this phone. It is running Android 4.4.4 KitKat, the latest and greatest version of the operating system currently available with, of course, Samsung's TouchWiz software. And Happily, TouchWiz, you know, there's my magazine. It's got right there. You can turn that off if you want. Maybe you like it. It's kind of Samsung's version of Flipboard on here. But TouchWiz is still heavy-handed in terms of looks, but it doesn't bog down the speed of the phone. It's, it's perfectly fine right here. And you can use third-party launchers if you want, if you don't like the little things that TouchWiz does. One of the things that we do have here is the split window multitasking. If you want, that's turned off by default. You can turn it on, and you can do split windows. Right there, we can bring it up, and we can have the web browser right here. And then we can have gallery over here. Uh, the screen's not that small or high resolution that it makes a whole lot of sense to me. But you can do this. You can switch top and bottom locations, copy and paste between them, resize these two windows. So the functionality is there. Smart Stay is also here, so it'll use the front camera, keep an eye on you, so it won't turn off the display if you're reading. I always enjoy that feature. And 
all the other little Samsung touches, some of which you may ignore because there are so many of them. Settings is the usual Samsung style settings. You can set it up as a bunch of circular blobs or you can have it the tab style or just a list setting. So just about everything on this phone is customizable. As you can see here, it has NFC. It works with ISIS mobile payments, Bluetooth 4.0 LE, dual band Wi-Fi 802.11ac, and of course 4G LTE on quite a few bands. This is an AT&T phone, but it does have the band support to work on T-Mobile as well, and it does work overseas for overseas roaming. And since the Alpha is obviously the, well, almost desperate competitor to the iPhone 6, even though it has the iPhone 5 styling, here it is size-wise, both 4.7-inch displays. Apple did not try to make the iPhone 6 particularly teeny, so it is a little bit bigger there, particularly in height. You're going to notice the difference. They're both very skinny phones. If you're talking about tenths of a millimeter and who wins, you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but equally as skinny, different side treatment, obviously, right? They're both nice looking from the side, thanks to their classy metal edges. Again, the Galaxy is a little bit lighter, half an ounce. I mean, they're both so skinny that whatever. And from the back, that's where they start to show their differences. Samsung, of course, still has the plastic back, and there are devotees of plastic, too. It does have nice characteristics, like it doesn't get icy cold in the winter, and it is grippy, less slippery than the iPhone, but there's the difference in the bags. And here we have a Samsung lineup in size order, just so you can get the idea, again, of all the different sizes. Galaxy Alpha, Galaxy S5, same black back on there. Galaxy S5 Active, also available on AT&T, has a ruggedized build on it, otherwise it's the same as the Galaxy S5. And here is the Samsung Galaxy Note 3. So there you go, you get the idea of the sizes that you're working with, and particularly entertaining is if you put this next to the Note 3. Well, there it is. And even while we're doing some comparisons, the Fire Phone, Amazon's Fire Phone, not that I think that all of you are running out to buy it, but it's 4.7 inches, it's upside down right now. There we go. It's a lot bigger, a lot heavier, a lot thicker. So Samsung, they did a good job making this thing as small as it could. Now in terms of horsepower and performance, Samsung did not cut back a bit with the little phone here, which is nice. Often the compact versions of the phones, like the Galaxy S5 Mini, have slower CPUs. This one has the same 2.5 gigahertz Qualcomm Snapdragon 801 quad-core CPU, 2.5 gigahertz Adreno 330 graphics, 2 gigs of RAM inside, and again, like I said, 32 gigs of storage. So, unsurprisingly, it scores as well as all the other Snapdragon 801 flagships on the market. So, for those of you who really like to play 3D games, for example, or are obsessed with horsepower, this phone's going to seem fast for quite some time. Quadrant, the score, 22,631. On Tutu, 43,147. 3D Mark Ice Storm Unlimited Test, 17,852. Sun Spider, the WebKit test uh, using the WebKit web browser rather than Chrome. It has both Chrome and the old WebKit browser on board. It scored 423, which is excellent where lower numbers are better. Just a little bit behind the iPhone 6 and similar to the Galaxy S5 and ahead of a lot of other Android phones. So, yeah, fast phone that it is. Good for games? Sure it is. 720p, you would think maybe since it's pus pushing around a few pixels that it's going to perform quicker. It didn't really do any better in 3D benchmarks, interestingly, but it does equally as well as the Galaxy S5 for playing games. And we're going to show you a game right now, in fact, so you can see we're going to test out Soulcraft, which is a RPG game. The speaker, by the way, fires out from the bottom here. Again, just like the iPhone. Funny that, not the back. And that's kind of better when it's firing away from you. Are you going to hear it so well? No. Also, notice USB port right here, micro USB. It's the 2.0 port. It's not the wider, longer part port. There's a 3.0 port used on the Galaxy S5. I don't think that's going to have anybody crying. Microphone hold down there. Power button on this side. Headphone jack up top. And our volume controls here, made of metal as well, right there. Nice raised, it feels good. You can find them, but they're not so easy to press. They're nice and firm. In fact, the front home button is a little firmer than usual too, so avoids accidental pressing. So here we are in Soulcraft, and I, be honest, the colors look really nice. The screen looks really sharp. I'm just not really going to complain so much about this screen. It's pleasant looking. And we're going to move our little big wing hero around here and right, take him the other way. 
see which role we can get into. Plays just fine. Looks lovely, looks sharp. And the speaker is at half volume, so that little speaker in the bottom is pretty darn loud. So there it is. Soulcraft 3D RPG playing on the Samsung Galaxy Alpha. Now we'll check out to see how a desktop website looks on this, and we'll go to our website, mobiletechreview.com. But first, here's the usual Samsung on-screen keyboard, which is one of the more enjoyable ones. Predictive text actually has a number row, now having to switch back and forth, so good times there. And at the moment, we're using the WebKit web browser. It does also have Chrome, so you've got both. 4.7 inches desktop site text is a little small but we can zoom in not quite as gorgeously and finely wrought say as on the LG G3 with its crazy 2K resolution 5.5 inch display but it looks good you can see plenty of detail here now sometimes when people say gee you can see more detail on the Galaxy S5 when you're watching a movie or something that's also because it's almost a half an inch larger that lets you see more detail in terms of actual rendering detail here it's pretty good we get really big like that, fine and sharp. So I, I think most people who look at this are going to like it just fine. Are we all wishing for 1080 and a teeny screen like this? Well, it certainly wouldn't hurt, would it? But well, we're not getting it. And that leads into to pricing. It's it's a well-made phone. It's a compact phone. It's it's reliable. It's a Samsung product. It has great LTE, CAD4 advanced LTE speeds here, up to 55 megabit per second for downloads we've seen. Good voice quality. But it's the same price as the Galaxy S5, and I think for most people, the metal edges aren't going to be enough to sell them when they feel like they're getting some more features well, on the Galaxy S5, like mostly that full HD 1920 by 1080 display on the Galaxy S5. Galaxy S5 also has the IR control for AV remote control, you know, your TV gear, all that sort of thing. You do get the fingerprint scanner here on the home button. It's the same swipe across to activate it. And happily, with firmware updates, Samsung has actually gotten that to be where, for me, it works most of the time if I'm using my finger and two hands. If you're trying to use your thumb by holding it sideways and doing it like this, you know, Samsung intends it to be up and down only. It doesn't work very reliably. But if you're okay using two hands to use it, you've got the fingerprint sensor. And again, you have the heart rate monitor back here and Samsung S Health, and the heart rate monitor. It works just fine. It also has a pedometer built in, too. So there's S Health right there. We got our exercise, our heart rate, pedometer list. Do the heart rate thing. I have my finger overneath, over the sensor right now. It shows you the last thing I registered 61. Pretty chilling. It also has a stress feature, and all that really does is look at your heart rate, too. So, not really good indicator of how stressed you are. I must be really stressed right now. Wow. Just jumped up there, huh? So it works. It's fairly accurate. Uh, are you dying to have this on your phone? I really don't know. That's up to you. Unlike the Galaxy S5 and the Galaxy S5 Active, this one is not water resistant, likely because that would make it even thicker. There's a rubber gasket around the back that adds some thickness to the back cover or some height to it. So this one, you can take a bath with it. Bath with it. Just don't drop it in the water because if you do, it probably will, well, just not work anymore. So how about battery life? Amply, as I said, you can take off this back cover and swap in a new battery. 1860 milliamps. That's just a little bit above what the iPhone 6 has. And, well, in order to make it this small and this thin, that's as much battery as they could get in there. The Samsung Galaxy S5 has a 2800 milliamp battery. Well, a lot bigger, isn't it? Of course, the S5 also powers a bigger display on it. Still, not as bad as I thought it would be. With moderate use, I had no trouble making it through a day on a charge, and that means from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night. Now, the Galaxy S5 would keep chugging on until about noon the next day, so obviously you have a lot less battery here. You still have that 2.5 gigahertz quad-core Snapdragon CPU inside, so it's going to eat more battery. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, overseas you guys may get one with the Samsung Exynos Octa CPU inside. That really depends on LTE radios at Qualcomm. 
obviously makes the processor. They make most of the LTE radios. So in the U.S. where we need lots of band support going on, we typically get the Snapdragon 801. The good news is that supports Qualcomm Quick Charge, so this guy will charge up very quickly like the rest of the Snapdragon 801 flagships that are on the market today. Lastly, how about that camera? 12 megapixel camera on the back. It is a Samsung ISOCELL camera and it does have phase detection autofocus for quick autofocus. Typically Samsung cameras are pretty good except in low light and this one behaves just about exactly like the Samsung Galaxy S5 in fact when it comes to performance with camera in low light. It's not a real good camera in low light folks. But there are worse they are worse, that's for sure. For example, the 2014 Moto X we recently reviewed, which we'll use as our subject here. That one is even worse in low light. So it's all the same Samsung features you've seen on recent phones, the, the Note 3, the Galaxy S5, plethora of settings available. You can turn your HDR on and off. You can do background settings here, switch between your cameras, hit the gallery up, and settings up the wazoo. It can record 4K video as well. You have tap to focus if you wish to do so. Shutter button right there. It's quick to focus. It works quite well. The pictures in general, I've been pretty pleased with them. Again, in low light, you're not going to see the best. Here's our sloppy kitchen. And if we zoom really in, you can see the, the, the drawers here don't have much detail. There's a little bit of noise back there. But you know what? For a camera phone, it's not that bad either. Here's a picture taken at night of a beautiful sky, and I was actually surprised if, sure, it does have some noise, but it captured the colors pretty accurately and is very nice, so not all night shots are a bust. In fact, you can even see the details of things like the power lines there off in the distance. That's, that's not bad. Indoor shot at the supermarket, sharp, colorful. So overall, it's a good camera. The difference between 12 and 16 megapixels, let's face it, in the Galaxy S5, they went up to 16 megapixels because everything is a specs race, particularly in Android. So it has to get better every year. It has to be a higher number at least. So that's why it is. Functionally, the difference between 12 and 16 megapixels for most people and the little bit of detail you're going to get really isn't so relevant there perfectly happy with this camera and I'm pretty picky about cameras. The front camera is the same 2.1 megapixel camera that's been used on all the other Samsung phones lately. It does an adequate job for things like Skype, whatever your favorite chatting is, or if you want to take selfies you can do it in 1080p video as well from the front camera. So largely I'm afraid this is a phone that's going to go, it's going to be ignored because Samsung just has way too many phones on the market right now. And because it costs almost as much as a Galaxy S5 retail and the same on contract here in the US, but it really is worth a look. If you pine for the days of the smaller 4.7 inch phone that really fits easily in the hand, you can actually use it with one hand. It's, it's worth a look. So that's the Samsung Galaxy Alpha. It's available now on AT&T Wireless in the United States. They do have the exclusive. I have no idea if it's ever going to come to another US carrier. It's also available overseas, obviously. And it's a nice phone. If it wasn't for the fact that Samsung Gadget spams us so much, I think people would pay more attention to this. And right now everybody likes a bigger phone, but some of you want a 4.7 inch phone and you don't want to compromise a lot. You get the speed, you get a good camera in here, you get NFC, LTE, all that sort of thing. It's really a pretty nice phone. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.